uh, uh, and you can also make appointments to see me separately. So no office hours on, uh, on Thursday. Uh, for the exam, we've, uh, we're changing the format some. We have like the last six or eight years of exams online. Uh, so if you looked at previous midterms, which is always a good idea, the nature of the questions will be similar, but we've changed the format. There are going to be six questions. You'll be given an exam, uh, not a blue book. There'll be eight pages to your exam. And uh, there'll be the first page you've already been emailed. It's like the instructions. You should read that now so you don't have to waste time reading. It's going to be exactly the same page on Thursday. Then there'll be six pages, and then there'll be a blank page for notes at the end. Leave it stapled, these, uh, these pages. Leave them stapled. If you scribble notes on the last page, rip that page off. But you need to return all seven other pages, the face page and the six pages. And you will choose five of those questions. So it'll be one question per page. And you can pick five of the six. Um, and um, we're only expecting about a two paragraph answer per question. Okay, so just like one handwritten page. If you need to use the back, that's okay, but we really don't expect that. So, uh, so with 75 minutes or so, we'll begin fairly promptly on Thursday. That's 15 minutes per question. There are no curveballs. It's, there's nothing tricky. If you've done the reading and come to lecture, or you'll be fine. Um, it's always a good idea in this class, and frankly in most classes, to review the slides. I put a lot of effort in my slides. They reflect what I think is important. And um, you know, familiarizing yourself with the slides and with the contents of lecture is a good idea. Some of the questions will, uh, will m most of the questions will require you to give focused answers to sort of, not, not too narrow, but like not broad. These are not essay questions that are asking you to integrate lots of topics, okay? That's like for the final exam. So it's, it, but they're not short answers either, like, you know, what is the doctrine of double effect? That's not the nature of the question. It might be something like, you know, um, uh, what is the doctrine of double effect? And uh, how is that relevant to care delivered at the end of life in the following example or something, okay? Any questions about the midterm? I know this is the first year I've offered it at Yale, so there's not a lot of local knowledge about it, but it's not, you know, it's very similar to what is offered at, I mean, it's, you'll tell your future colleagues in future years that it was a reasonable exam, let's put it that way. Um, any, oh, and there were some questions that had made to the TFs that had made it that the TFs had relayed to me, specifically related to the prognosis. Uh, let's see, one of the students, or a couple of students, were a little confused by what I described in class and uh, in terms of prognostic optimism and how well doctors know patients and what was described in the paper that I did with Elizabeth Lamont. So let me make, let me make this clear. The better the doctor knows the patient, the more likely the doctor was to make mistakes in prognosis, period. In that particular study, even though most of the mistakes were in the over-optimistic direction, the statistical association was only between doctors knowing the patients and the pessimistic errors. This is a trivial detail. That's not the main point. The main points are, in general, doctors are over-optimistic at the end of life. And second, in general, the more the doctors know the patient, the more prone they are to mistakes of either kind, optimistic or pessimistic. Is that clear? Okay, the second question was, um, uh, there was some confusion in that particular, when I showed, I did, we did some follow-up studies after that, there was some confusion as to whether we measured in that study what the doctors actually told the patients. Work like that has been done by other investigators. In that particular study, the entire study was we asked the doctors, what do you think is going to happen to this patient, tell us. And if the patient demanded to know a prognosis, what would you tell the patient? Tell us. We did not ask the patient, the doctor, what did you actually tell the patient, okay, in that particular study. And then we measured how long the patient lived, so we had three, three types of survival. Actual survival, formulated prognosis, and ostensibly communicated prognosis. And the third question was, someone asked about the Oki phenomenon, uh, whether uh, it was just a theoretical concern or actually did happen, does happen. It actually does happen. It's not, it is a, both a theoretical and actual phenomenon. But that's like a really, I mean, that was just a sidebar I did on the bulletin board. You don't, you know, that's nothing you necessarily need to know. Okay, any questions? Last time we discussed the contrast between the desired and actual terminal care that Americans uh, ha want and have. 
We saw how Americans pay a lot for their care at the end of life and that they have quite reasonable expectations about the kind of care they'll get at the end of life. But we also saw that they are, alas, unable to get the care they want uh, and deserve. This session, I'm going to be focusing on the problem of medical harm or iatrogenesis. The question is, how extensive is medical harm? What might be done about it? And how are patients and physicians affected by it? And in fact, it's, it's well to ask you know, what, what, uh, what to make of Illich's very strident critique. Here's what Illich, how Illich opens his book in the readings assigned uh, for this week. Illich says, the medical establishment has become a major threat to health. The disabling impact of professional control over medicine has reached the proportions of an epidemic. Iatrogenesis, the name for this new epidemic, comes from iatros, iatros, the Greek word for physician, and genesis, meaning origin. Discussion of the disease of medical progress has moved up on the agendas of medical conferences. Researchers concentrate on the sick-making powers of diagnosis and therapy, and reports on paradoxical damage caused by cures for sickness tape, take up increasing space in medical dope sheets. He's, he's angry, right? Illich is, is not happy with the state of affairs. And he's utterly convinced. He opens his book with a polemic. Uh, medical, you know, the medical establishment has become a threat to health. Now, when I was in my own clinical training, and I was a, a new resident, I was, uh, how old was I? I was uh, 26 or 27. And I had just started uh, in my first week in the emergency room at the University of Pennsylvania. And we had a a much revered senior resident who was very wise and experienced. And, uh, and he took us aside the first week and he said to us, and I'll never forget it, don't forget, he said to us, hospital admission is not a benign procedure. We kill patients when we admit them to the hospital, he said to us. Bad things can happen to people under medical care and we need to take this possibility very seriously. So obviously mostly good things happen to people under medical care. But if you thought that nothing bad ever happened to people as a result of medical care, and or if you thought it was a small problem, I think your opinions will be changed. Now, there are many different types of medical harm. An error or a mistake is the failure of a planned action to be completed or the use of a wrong plan. And an adverse event is an injury resulting from a medical intervention rather than from the disease itself. And it typically involves an error. But not all errors lead to harm. Sometimes you make a mistake and no one is harmed by it. And not all harms are the result of errors. There can also just be a malocurrence. Something bad happens and it's not like anyone made a mistake. And not all of those are negligent, since negligence is judged according to local standards. Negligence is care falling below the standard of care in the community. So just because in the hands of the world's best surgeon, a bad outcome would not have occurred does not mean a doctor whose care results in a bad outcome has been negligent, okay? You, you know, we can't compare every doctor on the planet to the best doctor for each little thing that might be done and then accuse all other doctors of somehow being, making mistakes or being negligent. Finally, there's also the problem of poor quality care which subsumes all of the foregoing and more. Now, Illich and others lump all of these under the term iatrogenesis, or doctor-caused injury. And this term and medical harm, the term medical harm, are the most general terms. And here's one way to group these kinds of events together. So you might imagine that there's a medical intervention. Uh, after this intervention, there could be an error or no error. After this error, there could be a good outcome. Um, you know, that's the best path. Or there could be no error and a good outcome, but nevertheless, there could be some kind of adverse reaction. Something bad happens uh, to the patient. Or there could be an error, and the error could be inconsequential. Or it could be a significant error, a potential adverse event, uh, but then a bad, actually, I'm sure that should say bad outcome. No error and bad outcome. I don't know why that says good. Um,
uh, a bad outcome, and, uh, and actually the, the version of the slides that's going to be online is, is going to be incorrect. Maybe I'll fix it. Uh, or there could be a bad outcome, which is preventable, and that will be deemed an adverse event. So an error was made. It was a significant error. There was a potential adverse event. The patient, alas, did not recover. Something bad happened, and we'll call that an adverse event. And in many medical situations, you can have a fulminating combination of all of these with error upon error, malpractice upon malocurrence, and harm upon harm. Now, the bad things that can happen to you while you're in a hospital or under medical care run the gamut. Uh, this is an example of a very rare but particularly nasty drug reaction called toxic epidermal necrolysis, or, or Stephen Johnson syndrome, SJS. And in it, skin literally sloughs off. It is an immune complex mediated hypersensitivity disorder that can be caused by many drugs, but also by viral infections and malignancy. So your body attacks your own skin and your skin just sheds you kind of like a snake, you get rid of your skin. And it's fatal in roughly three to 15% of cases. But whether you would judge this to be merely an adverse reaction or a negligent adverse event would depend of course on whether the patient survived did he recover? He didn't actually die. And on whether the doctor should have known that the patient was allergic to the drug that was given. So if you, in good faith, give the patient a drug, you had no reason to suspect the patient was allergic, the patient needed the drug, then they get this nasty reaction to the drug, it's not your fault. It's just a part of medical care, even though the patient has been harmed, and this is not a good thing. Now, adverse drug reactions, including severe ones like this, are actually not uncommon. And here's a paper that I was introduced to uh, by an expert in the problem of medical harm, a man by the name of Lucien Leap, when I was a medical student uh, 30 years or so ago. And I uh, had gone to the Beth Israel Hospital in Boston for my medical rotation, and we just were required to go to this lecture. And I went to this lecture, and, uh, and, and in this lecture, Dr. Leap, uh, you know, who's like 20 or 30 years older than me then and now, uh, presents this as an example. Uh, and the, pa and the, the paper is intratracheal fire ignited by a, I guess that's neodymium, ND-YAG laser uh, during treatment for tracheal stenosis. So this patient has a fire inside his body. Uh, and medical care did this to him. So I'm looking at this and I'm just horrified at this type of a situation, that a patient admitted to the hospital could be subjected to our medical treatment. This is a rare thing. Uh, and the oxygen that was flowing into his lungs while he was having this procedure done was ignited by the laser, and he's on fire inside his body. So being in a hospital is indeed not safe if you can even get fires inside your body and not just outside your body. And here's another recent case. Uh, from a few years ago, man has wrong kidney removed in London. Medical officials said on Thursday that doctors at a Scottish hospital had removed the wrong kidney from a patient during an operation. John Heron, who media reports said was believed to be in his 60s, had the healthy organ taken out during surgery at Ayr Hospital. It is with deep regret that I confirm that a patient being cared for in the Ayr Hospital has had a healthy kidney removed said Bob Masterton, executive director of the NHS Ayrshire and Aaron Trust. Our thoughts are with the patient and family to whom we apologize for this tragic error. Staff are supporting the patient, it's a little late, I think. Uh, staff are supporting the patient and family in planning for the best possible medical care for Mr. Heron in the future, <laughs> not, not the care that he's had so far. And in a statement, Heron's family said they were devastated by the disastrous professional errors that should never have happened. Uh, and these cases are not unheard of. A study of 20 years worth of malpractice claims revealed this frequency of such so-called never events, events that should, uh, should never happen. Uh, and and so, uh, so these are surgical never events. There were 10,000 of them overall, and they cost about 133,000 was a medium malpractice payment. Uh, surgical retained foreign body, the most common. Uh, wrong procedure, you know, the wrong procedure was done on the patient. Wrong site, the correct procedure but the wrong site or wrong patient uh, did the right procedure, uh, but on the wrong uh, patient was uncommon. Uh, I don't know why you, you get paid less for having the wrong, the correct procedure done on the wrong patient than the incorrect procedure done on the right patient is a little bit of a mystery to me. You know, I think it should be much worse, uh, that particular category. And between 1990 and 2000, there were roughly 5,000 reported cases in the United States of wrong site, wrong procedure, or wrong person surgery. Um, 
But here's an interesting detail from the British case, the Scottish case we just read about, from another newspaper. Exclusive, man who had wrong kidney, uh, uh, had wrong kidney removed, breaks silence. And it's highlighted in yellow, but I'll read it to you. It said, John said he told doctors minutes before the operation that the pain was on his left side, not on his right side. But they had already marked his body with a pen and dismissed his fears, even though they had not seen vital x-rays showing the tumor on his left kidney. So the patient is trying, it's like in that Monty Python thing, I'm not dead yet, you know, yes you are, no I'm not. The patient is trying to say that it's on this side, not on this side, and the doctor says, no, 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 you know, we're going to operate on the other side because we already put the X mark, we're not going to stop and listen to the patient. And in fact, the majority of these cases are indeed due to a breakdown in communication between the surgical team and the patient and family, according to a study done by the Joint Commission on the Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations. Emergency procedures, unusual equipment, staff rotations, or time pressures are also frequent causes of these never events. Something out of ordinary is taking place, and that results in that something bad happening. And the need for improved communication is stress to patients to the extent of even highlighting their responsibility to communicate with their doctors so as to avoid medical mistakes. This is a tip sheet from the United States Federal Agency, the Agency for Healthcare Quality uh, and Re for, from AHRQ, Agent, Agency for Healthcare Quality and Research, on the ways to prevent medical errors. And it mentions the problem of right part surgery. So it says, for example, uh, ways you can help your family prevent medical errors. So it says, uh, medical errors are mistakes that can happen uh, with your health care. Medical errors can hurt or even kill people. And then below it says, what can you do to make sure the doctor operates on the right part of your body? Error. The doctor operates on the wrong part of your body. Uh, and here's what you can do. Talk to your doctor about the surgery. Ask what will be done. Ask if the surgeon does this kind of surgery often. Ask your surgeon to make a mark with a pen on the part of your body, and so forth. So other tips in this handy pamphlet include things like be an active member of your healthcare team, encouraging the patient to be an active part of their team so as to reduce the incidence of medical errors. And the effort involves patient, the involving patients can go quite far. The federal government, through the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, has made some further suggestions. And, uh, and here's another suggestion, reducing medical mistakes. Patient safety is one of today's most pressing healthcare challenges. The most important thing you can do to improve your health care is to take an active role in your care. You can enhance the quality, safety, and effectiveness of your care, your diagnosis, your treatment, and any, medica and any medications prescribed to you. Just ask questions. And in fact, they've even produced this amusing video called Questions Are the Answer. So listen, watch this video carefully. Any questions? No. You know. Well, So what strikes you about that video? <laughs> what? People's thoughts on this video. The yeah. Are all male and the nurses are all female. Okay. <laughs> I think you're right actually about that. Okay, that's a very good observation. <laughs> what else? The nurses appear to be able to dance better, at least, than the doctors, but that's another story. Yes? Um, some of the things that they have the patients asking, like, will this react to my other medicine, or things that the doctor really should be worried about to begin with? Okay, so some of the things that the, the patients are asked to um, 
you know, that the patients are encouraged to do, you think the doctor should be doing anyway. Now, of course, you're the one that's going to suffer most from a mistake, so you have a bigger stake in the correct treatment. But yes, I agree. But keep going. Other ideas. Maybe developing that idea a little bit. Yes? It kind of made it seem like if the mistake was made, it was more the fault. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a really interesting and subtle shift. So on the one hand, it's totally reasonable and right to expect that you should pay attention during your medical care. Because if a mistake is made, you're going to suffer. So that's a logical, appropriate thing to do. And actually, the more, pe more eyes on what's happening to you, the better. On the other hand, there's this kind of weird, subtle shift that has taken place, where by now we're coming to think of maybe it's the patient's responsibility more even than the doctor's to avoid uh, the catastrophes. So the question is, you know, yes, it's great to encourage patients to have an active role, but is this shift in responsibility to the patient too much? And what is the balance between the institution and the individual? And what are patients' rights and what are patients' responsibilities? Yet it turns out the problem of medical harm can get still worse. Probably none of you recognize these healthcare workers. They are all doctors and nurses and in healthcare workers. But actually, on the far left, we have Mr. Charles Cullen, not from, um, the, not from the Twilight things, which, which I love, but that's another story. Uh, so uh, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, who wouldn't want the Cullens home? That's obvious. But anyway, um, I, I could do without the kind of diamond skin, but that's another thing. Uh, so, who, so on the far left is Charles Cullen, uh, a nurse who admitted to killing at least 29 patients in 2006. In the middle is Dr. Michael Swango, called Double O Swango by his colleagues, who killed between 35 and 60 patients in numerous hospitals around the United States over a period from 1984 till 2000. And on the far right is the most prolific serial killer ever found. It's Dr. Harold Shipman, who had 218 known victims in England from 1970 to 1998. He, did, he killed his patients by giving them injections of medications. Now, indeed, some of the most prolific serial killers have been doctors and nurses. And one of the reasons for this is that, A, they have very easy access to victims, and B, they have no need to dispose of the body. Right? If you're a killer, getting rid of a body is often a serious problem. It's not just a joke you see in movies. Uh, but uh, actually, if you're a health care provider, this is not such a challenge. And often, in many of these cases, there was complicity of the hospital bu bureaucracy. That is, there's a sense in which this phenomenon is an illustration of a broader kind, a social kind of iatrogenesis, which I'll return to in a moment, and which uh, Illich also discusses. There's some sense in these cases that the healthcare system can be seen as responsible for them, at least in part. For example, in both the Shipman and the Swango cases, and in others like it, subsequent inquiries revealed that the medical establishment principally through apathy, actually protected the murdering doctors, turning a blind eye to their activities, often in the name of preserving professional independence from external review. Licensing boards and other authorities refused to revoke the ability of such doctors to practice, despite compelling early evidence of such doctors acting in a fashion severely injurious to patients. And then these are all dramatic examples that I've given you. But most mistakes are much more mundane, involving the administration of the wrong drug or some human or mechanical error that is, to a greater or lesser extent, avoidable or unavoidable. But overall, mistakes, both minor and major, are not uncommon. And they occur across the whole spectrum of care from diagnosis to treatment. And the burden medical harm imposes is significant. Adverse events occur in 3.7% of hospitalizations. 27.6% of these events are due to negligence. And 13.6% of these events result in death and 2.6% in serious disability. In fact, between 44,000 and 100,000 Americans die each year due to medical errors occurring inside or outside of the hospital. And the total costs of all of this are between 17 and $29 billion each year. And this rate of error and of death is significant because there are more than 13 million hospitalizations each year in the elderly alone. In fact, as I'll come back to in a moment, this amount of death would put medical error as a top 10 killer in our, you know, the list of top 10 causes of death that we've been discussing throughout the course so far. Yeah, so here it is. So the number of deaths from medical error places medical error in the top 10 leading causes between number eight and possibly as high as number five. So at 100,000 deaths, you might have more people being killed by 
healthcare system than die of diabetes, for example, or influenza and pneumonia in the country every year, every year, or even than Alzheimer's disease. So medical error is a leading killer in our society. And even at the low end of 44,000, which is one of our best estimates from, you know, uh, from the Institute of Medicine, more people die from medical errors than from motor vehicle accidents, which kills 43,000 people, breast cancer, which kills 43,000, or AIDS, which kills 17,000. In fact, every year, 6,000 Americans die of workplace injuries, but 7,000 die from medication errors alone. And looking at other industries, it turns out that compared to other industries or practices, healthcare is actually very hazardous. Uh, and the failure rate, so here on the y-axis is the total uh, lives lost per year. And on the left, on the, the x-axis is the number of encounters for each fatality on a log-log plot. So here bungee jumping, uh, you know, we don't lose too many people per year to bungee jumping. Uh, but the number of encounters for each fatality, uh, you know, I don't know, it's about uh, 100 bungee jumping. That doesn't seem, seems a bit high. So maybe it's up 200 or something uh, might die. Here's mountain climbing. You know, a climber might die well, one out of 1,000 outings or one out of 500 outings. Uh, here's, uh, and these are dangerous. Healthcare is here. These are all in the dangerous category, bungee jumping and mountain climbing. Healthcare, there are 100,000 lives or as many as 100,000. It's somewhere up near here, a loss per year. Uh, and the number of encounters for each fatality is on the order of 1,000. Here's driving, which is highly regulated, chemical manufacturing, and chartered airlines. And here's ultra safe, which includes scheduled airlines, European railroads, and nuclear power. So we have these types of uh, uh, industries which are very highly regulated and are ultra, ultra safe, but healthcare is way over here in this axis. And the failure rate per encounter in the United States healthcare system seems unreasonably high, possibly as large in, as one out of 200 to one out of 1,000 encounters being fatal as you saw in your readings for today. So the question comes, where do these mistakes originate? What are the causes, the agency level causes and the structural level causes of these mistakes? It is, this, is it the structure that surrounds the patient and the doctor, or is it the agency of the doctor or the patient? For example, the patient not asking enough questions, maybe that's what's causing the error. Yeah, Shona. I think that's just adverse events on that particular, uh, on that particular slide. Um, so the question becomes, you know, who is responsible? Where does the responsibility for errors lie? Is it within the system uh, or with the doctor? And in fact, there's a tension. There's, an attention when it com there's a tension when it comes to uh, figuring out the locus of responsibility. On the one hand, you can, have, you can imagine that the do no harm is a rule of personal responsibility where the doctor, him or herself, has agency that's relevant and is obligated not to harm the patient and is responsible for the harms that accrue to the patients. Or you can see safety and adverse events and mistakes as being a system level property, a structural feature of the healthcare system, and not something the doctor per se has agency uh, over. Now, since some error is unavoidable, and since error is intrinsic, Physicians need to learn to cope with it, both pragmatically, that is to reduce it, and personally, that is to deal with its existence. So any of you that become physicians, it is a certainty that you will make mistakes in the, in the course of your career. And uh, it is likely that those, some of those mistakes will be severe, and probably one or two of you will wind up accidentally killing a patient. And it is devastating and unavoidable. So the challenge is not only how to reduce the occurrence of such errors, but also how to learn to cope with the existence of errors, to cope with the fact that we're human, we go to practice medicine, and sometimes we make mistakes. Let's, look, let's start with this heart, when we, now in discussing the locus of responsibility, let's start with this heartbreaking case from outside of medicine. Every year there are several such cases. This is a case from 2008. Uh, an error that warrants, is, it, is this an error that warrants responsibility or blame or a change in the system? Baby dies after dad forgot her in car. Houston, 2008. A baby died after her father forgot to take her to daycare Friday morning, officials told KPRC Local 2. Houston police said the father discovered his mistake when he got to the daycare at Crawford Street near Rosedale Street in southeast Houston Friday evening. He was there to pick up his seven-month-old daughter and her brother, who was taken to the facility separately. Houston police officer Sergeant Robert Blaine said, he forgot about dropping her off and instead went directly to work at Rice University and parked in the parking lot over there. 
He returned around 5 p.m. to his car, drove back to the pickup his son and his daughter at daycare, and upon arrival here at daycare, discovered the seven-month-old infant was in the back of the car. The girl was rushed to the hospital where she was pronounced dead. Investigators said they believe she died from the heat. Police said taking the children to daycare separately was a change in routine for the family. The mother dropped off the girl's brother separately because of swim practice. Detectives said they believe this was an accident. As of Friday night, no charges had been filed and the investigation continued. You will see cases like this in the next few months, I guarantee you, in the news, and you'll start thinking about them a different way as we walk through some of what's happening in these cases. In fact, similar cases occurred. Again, in Virginia in 2008, the father was prosecuted by the district attorney. This is the case of Mike uh, Miles Harrison. He was prosecuted by the district attorney for murder. Now, this is clearly an error, but what do you think caused this baby's death? So I'm going to ask you to raise your hands. Do you think it was the dad's actions or the drop-off system? Who, think it was, who thinks it was the dad's actions that caused this baby's death? Raise your hands. Who thinks it was the drop-off system? Okay, so every year this is about the similar split that we get. Now imagine that you're a surgeon and that there's been a change in routine. And in fact, this is one of the, the prototypic kinds of errors that reason discusses in your reading for today for which, in principle, systems changes might be put in place to prevent. So let me ask you this. What kind of system might we want to prevent this example of a kid in a car? Let's say you said, you know, we are tired of these deaths occurring. Uh, human beings are fallible. Moms and dads will sometimes forget the baby in the car. We need to put systems in place to prevent it. What could be some systems we would do? Suggestions for how to stop this scourge in our country. An alarm in the car. So if, if uh, the baby, you hear a noise in the car when the car is not, you know, the ignition is not turned on, uh, send a text message to the owner of the vehicle. Or sound an alarm. The horn should start pumping. Maybe someone will see it. Good idea. What else? Any other clever solutions to this catastrophe? Yeah. Hannah. Say that again. Yeah. The daycare, there should be a system of routine notification of parents when the child does not arrive. Now, what would be a problem with that? Is there a problem with that system, maybe? Yeah, there'd be lots and lots of false positive, lots of calls to parents, and they go, of course, I took the kids to the dentist today, you know, but maybe we could tweak that system. Other ideas? Yeah. Excellent. So you can develop your own personal rituals to avoid this catastrophe. Having seen this case, those of you in the future that have your own babies may remember this example and you'll come up with this type of a thing. Other ideas? Any other ways to prevent these types of catastrophes? Well, you can imagine these and other types of possibilities that might be, uh, you know, might be implemented. Technological or checklists, you know, dad, from now on, every day dad goes to the car and signs a checklist, you know, keys in pocket, yes, lunch packed, yes, a baby at day, oh, damn, the baby's in the car, you know, uh, babe better go to the daycare center, uh, you know, go back to the hot car and retrieve my baby. And the question is, we might have to decide, is it worth it? Because these systems might cost millions and millions of dollars and we might save a dozen lives a year. So we'll have to decide, is that the best way to use our millions of dollars? Or maybe we will, in a very cruel-hearted fashion, consign a certain number of babies to this hot death because we don't want to spend the money on it. And another question arises, who should decide? You know, do we want the state to specify all car manufacturers henceforth should have these devices in the cars to prevent these kinds of disasters? Or will we see that as an untoward structural constraint on individual liberty and agency? Why should I be forced to pay for this feature? You know, I never transport babies in my car, or I am not the kind of dad who would forget, so I don't want to pay for it, etc. These are not trivial policy questions, and of course they come up with any kind of such dilemma. So I'd like to turn now to the problem of blame. Because many of you were interested in blaming the, the, the uh, father and thought the father was responsible for this error. A very influential report was released by the Institute of Medicine in 2000, trenchantly entitled, To Err is Human. And it identified several ways to reduce medical harm, one of which was the following, that healthcare organizations should implement non-punitive systems for reporting and analyzing errors. That we should have the same kind of thing that happens in the airline industry whenever there's a mistake, 
everyone is supposed to honestly report the mistake. These data are collected, so we have endless improvement in the quality of our aeronautical industry in a way that's typically not the case in the healthcare industry. And the Institute of Medicine and other official policymaking bodies and experts in medical error have championed the need for a blame-free culture in medicine. Let's stop blaming doctors and nurses for medical errors. And, in, and advocated implementing systems for detecting and reporting errors similar to other industries. And it is commonly argued that the best way to uncover and reduce error is to promote a culture where no blame is ascribed for individual actions. Moreover, in this paradigm, most errors are viewed largely as system-based as impossible to eradicate completely and as infrequently traceable to truly negligent actions. Blame is seen as doing more harm than good, as engendering feelings of inadequacy or fear of punishment, and as ultimately pushing analysis and recognition of mistakes underground and limiting opportunities for improvement. So the argument goes, we don't want blame for all of the foregoing reasons. One could even imagine a decision tree for blame. So you could imagine, uh, so you could imagine, you know, uh, were the views, uh, were the actions as intended, yes or no? Were the consequences as intended, yes? That's sabotage, malevolent damage, suicide, etc. That's like the doctors who try to kill their patients deliberately. Were the actions as intended, uh, no? Uh, was there an unauthorized substance? Was the doctor abusing drugs of some kind? Uh, Yes, did he have a medical condition? He had substance abuse without mitigation or substance use with mitigation uh, and so forth here. Did he knowingly violate safe operating procedures? Yes. Were the procedures available, workable, intelligent, intelligible and correct? Yes or no. Possible reckless violations, system induced violations. So he, did, uh, he, didn't knowingly he did not knowingly violate, uh, he knowingly violated the problem, but there was no good systems in place, so it's not his fault. Did he pass a substitution test? That is, could you have made the same mistake? You think of yourself, would you have done, could you have made, could you have forgotten your baby in the car? Yes, I could have forgotten my baby in the car. You know, if you can imagine that, that's a different kind of error. Deficiencies in training and so forth, history of unsafe facts and so forth. So if you can get all the way, you can have a diminishing culpability according to this kind of a metric. And the provenance of this slide is interesting. It's from James Reason, from a paper by Reason called, called a book by James Reason called Managing the Risks of Organizational Accidents, because Reason is, in fact, a proponent of blame-free culture and the system's perspective. And the substitution test, as I mentioned, is could you see yourself making this mistake? So raise your hands if you could see yourself as making the mistake of leaving a baby in the car. Raise your hands if you don't think you could possibly forget your baby in the car. Be honest. All right. Well, this is the system's perspective on blame and medical error. The system's perspective on blame for medical error says the following, or it presumes the following. The best people can make the worst errors. Short-lived mental states, such as forgetfulness or inattention, are the last and least manageable part of an error sequence. People will always make errors and commit violations. Blaming people for their errors will have no effect on their future fallibility like the driver and the baby. And there are two types of human fallibility, the two types of human fallibility include the following. So one is a post-completion error and one is a miscompletion error. So a post-completion error is omitting the final step in a process. So raise your hands if you've ever left the last page of a document you're Xeroxing on the Xerox machine. Right? Oops. You did everything, you Xeroxed it, you went to the library, you took the document, you Xeroxed it, and you you're, you're, uh, leave the last page on. That's like surgeons who forget an instrument in the patient's body. They do the whole procedure, they're getting to the end of the procedure, they're suturing up the body, and oops, they have a, a last step that they make a mistake on. Just like you, except when they make that kind of mistake in a patient, it's much more consequential than merely leaving a document on a Xerox machine. Or um, a miscompletion error is another kind of a thing. I made a mistake like this uh, a couple of years ago. So, you, for example, you're starting a drive uh, and you take a left instead of a right uh, because you're going to school instead of work on that day. So you're driving down uh, Whitney Avenue and on that particular day, usually when you drive down Whitney Avenue, you turn right on Grove Street and you come to work. Uh, but that particular day, you intended to go uh, to the movie theater. And uh, because you usually drive on Whitney Avenue and maybe Call Me Maybe came on, it was a really distracting song, so you're driving along and Call Me Maybe comes on, and instead of going straight as you intended, you turn right and absentmindedly go to uh, 17 Hill House. So, um, 
So how many of you have found yourself, for example, heading out uh, to, your, uh, to a location, and you wind up where your math class is instead of your physics class for that day? Yeah, you think it's the wrong day. So this was what happens to doctors, except instead of winding up at the wrong location, you've now done the wrong procedure. Uh, you start cutting open a patient, you think you're doing one procedure instead of another, and you just complete that procedure instead of something else. Here's another example. This is a reenactment of an event in Ezra Stiles College. Here are the tater tots that are on offer that day. So you take your tray and you put it on the counter. And the procedure is you place uh, the plate on the tray. You see the plates up here? The proper procedure is you're going to take a, a plate from here and put it on the tray. And then you're going to take this scoop and you're going to put the tater tots on the plate. But oops, you make a mistake. <laughs> you forget the middle step which is to put the plate on the tray. And uh, you put the tater tots directly on your uh, on your, uh, on your tray. So what, what, what kind of systems might you put in place to stop this type of catastrophe? Uh, one possibility might be a checklist, OK? Is, is the tray on the counter? Yes. Uh, is the plate on the tray? Yes. Is the food on the plate? Yes. Excellent. I'm all set. Or you could redesign the system, and you could, you could glue the plates to the trays so every tray would come with a pre-glued plate so you would prevent these type of miscompletion errors in the past. So is it my fault? that I put the tater tots on the tray, or instead is it a systems error which we can have a technical fix to by adhering the plates uh, to the trays. So current thinking about the occurrence and prevention of errors focuses on, uh, on this type of a systems perspective. I'm not sure I entirely agree, but let me tell you about this type of systems perspective on medical error. So this is the reigning paradigm in medicine right now, this system conception. It says that healthcare is a complex system, it is, that errors and harm result from multiple faults and diffuse breakdowns, that humans are just one part of the system, and that errors are an intrinsic part of the system. And the argument in this perspective is that healthcare is a complex and technological industry that's prone to accidents and that we need to figure out a way to take into account the propensity of humans to make mistakes, like the mistakes you've all admitted to right now, and which you will continue to yourselves make. And in fact, when large systems fail, um, it is typically due to multiple faults that occur together. And this is Reason's well-known Swiss cheese model that was in your readings. Every step in a process has the potential for failure. And the failures the, uh, and the mistakes only occur when all the holes in the Swiss cheese line up exactly right. So there's a series of holes that begin way back here, and one step after another, everything aligns perfectly, and now you have an accident or something like that. Whereas when the holes don't line up in the system, then the, the error is blocked. So in some sense, it's not fair to blame this layer of Swiss cheese for the error when all these other layers also were responsible, had to align for the error to actually take place. One of the greatest contributors to accidents in any industry, including healthcare, is human error. That's true. However, saying that an accident is due to human error is not the same as assigning blame, because most human errors are induced by system failures, this perspective claims. Humans commit errors for a variety of known and complicated reasons. And these reasons are called latent errors, or systems failures. And they are felt to pose the greatest threat to the safety in complex systems because they lead to operator errors. They are failures built into the system and present long before the active error of the last step, which is the doctor or nurse delivering care. And a typical example of a latent error is the packaging of two different medications in the same kind of ampule, with one medicine being benign and another deadly. Who can blame a doctor or a nurse who accidentally administers the wrong medication in such circumstances? I mean, why was this deadly and benign drug so similar in appearance? Wouldn't we design a system that made them look different to make it less likely that the doctor would accidentally, when tired or exhausted or busy, reach for the wrong medication? And current responses to error tend to focus on active errors, although this may sometimes be appropriate. In many cases, it's not an effective way to make systems safer. Discovering and fixing latent errors is likely to have a greater effect on building safer systems than efforts to minimize errors at the point in which they occur. So the systems perspective says, look, trying to get doctors to seal up the holes of the Swiss cheese is not the wisest course of action. What we really want to do is focus on all the layers and built-in fail-safe procedures into our system. 
The application of human factors analysis in other industries has actually successfully reduced errors in those industries. And actually, people think that healthcare has to look at medical error not as a special case of medicine, but as a special case of error, and to apply the theory and approaches already used in other fields to reduce errors and improve reliability. Hence, the system perspective believes that medical accidents are usually the result of complex systems failures. And although incompetent and malfeasant staff exist, adverse outcomes are more commonly the result of systems problems. The argument is that safety in medicine will not improve unless the complex systems are redesigned. And this system perspective has proposed various fail-safe devices and technical fixes similar to the changes implemented in, uh, implemented in aviation safety, such as checklists and foolproof equipment design. Here are some suggested changes to parts of the system having to do with the administration of medications. So let's reduce the wrong drug that doctors give to patients. There are all kinds of technical fixes we can implement. We can have pharmacy computer systems, automated dispensing cabinets, uh, barcoded drug selection, barcoded patient identification. So we swipe the patient and the drug, and the computer checks what the human wants to do. Computer-generated or electronic medication administration records, electronic drug information. It's easy for the doctor to look up problems with medicines, or checklists that doctors and others can look at before administering medications. For example, there are many reasons for unclear medication orders and technological interventions which modify the structure circumventing the physician's agency might fix. For example, dispensing errors can be made because medication names are misinterpreted, misread, or misunderstood. There are, in fact, hundreds of drugs with similar names that can be confused or interchanged. So quinine is not the same as quinidine. Sulfasalazine is not the same as sulfadiazine. Hydroxazine is not the same as hydralazine. Losic and Lasix are completely different drugs. Clonopin and clonidine are different drugs, and so forth and so on. Um, and, and why do these drugs, why do we allow them to be named similarly? Setting the doctor up for a catastrophic error. What a stupid doctor. He administered the wrong drug. It's his fault. Why? Why not rename the drugs to make it less likely that these mistakes would occur? And in fact, some brand name drugs cause so much confusion and frequent medication error that the manufacturer voluntarily changes brand names. And one example is Losec, uh, which was here, which was eventually renamed Prilosec, to avoid the confusion with Lasix, which was causing so many problems. And Prilosec now is an over-the-counter drug you can buy uh, in a pharmacy. And this sort of thing can happen to anyone, and not just doctors. This is an example from my home last year. My brother was visiting, and he left his toiletries in our bathroom, and I wanted to borrow his shaving cream. So I'm about to shave, and I reach for my Edge uh, shaving cream that's right on the counter. Uh, and there uh, on the right is my shaving cream, and there on the left was the product that he had. Raise your hands if you use Edge shaving cream. OK, so you know what I'm talking about. There are not too many of you. Uh, but these are very similarly packaged products, but they're completely different. One is shaving cream, which offers ultimate closeness and ultimate comfort, and is used for shaving. And one is Lotrimin, which is clinically proven to cure athlete's foot and relieves itching, burning, cracking, and scaling. But for the God's sakes, they're packaged completely similarly. And I don't usually have this product in my bathroom. And I'm reaching to shave, and I put the you know, Lotrimin uh, in my hand. Okay. So whose fault is that? Is that my fault? Or is that a change in routine and I shouldn't invite my brother to visit anymore or to fix his athlete's foot before he comes to my house? <laughs> and in fact, these products, you know, uh, these products have different uses. And the same kind of thing happens in medical care. And we need to think about what to do about it. And there's no doubt that such changes in systems improvements are very effective. Here are some results uh, from a study involving computerized uh, order entry by doctors. So this was error reduction when the doctors were obliged to computerize their order entry instead of handwriting it. Serious medication errors were reduced by 55%, prescribing errors by 19%, transcription errors hugely reduced. Because in the olden days, I would write, handwrite my orders, and then the nurses would read those handwritten orders and rewrite them into their books. Leading to a cascade of difficult to read handwriting and interpretation problems. Dispensing errors went down, administration errors went down, preventable uh, ADEs or adverse drug uh, reactions went down, and non intercepted potential ADEs also were reduced. 
And in fact, there are other structural uh, threats to patient safety too, uh, beyond the sort of we focused on medication error so far, but there are other kinds of ways in which the healthcare system is organized that places patients at risk. This is something known as the July phenomenon. So every year, the house officers in hospitals, doctors in training, rotate approximately on July 1st. So you had interns that have spent 12 months, their first year of medical training after medical school, suddenly becoming residents, having more responsibility, and you have this huge influx of people school that are suddenly interns and have a huge amount of responsibility. I'll never forget when you're a medical student and you're being trained to be a doctor, you can write basically pretend prescriptions. You say, I would give the patient drugs A, B, and C, uh, but the nurse doesn't actually administer the medication unless your supervising physician countersigns the order, right? The doctor reviews. And the first week of, uh, first week I was an intern, I had uh, caring for a patient with congestive heart failure and I wrote down my orders for what medications to give the patient and the nurse administered them. And I was like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Isn't someone going to check? You know, you did what I said. What if I made a mistake? What if I made a mistake? I'm the doctor now. Well, I write it. The patient gets administered it. So July 1st, we get all these new doctors that come in to the hospital. And the question is, is this associated with mortality? If you have a similar illness and you're admitted in June versus July, are you more likely to die in July because everyone is less experienced at every level of uh, the chain? And the answer is yes. So on the left is uh, average length of stay in days, and on the right is average mortality rate in percentage. So this is the mortality rate. It has this parabolic shape. Uh, why does it have that parabolic shape? Mortality in hospital admissions, does anyone know? Yeah? Yeah, so there's, there's seasonal variation in mortality. Deaths are more common in the winter than in the summer. So you have this parabolic shape, and here is the shape that would have occurred if it had followed this parabolic shape, you see this red line, but actually you have this tiny deflection up from the red line, this is estimated by Huckman and Barrow in this well-known NBR working paper, uh, upward deflection, a flattening of the curve from what would have been expected because of the young doctors that are suddenly in a position of authority. So major teaching facilities show evidence of a July phenomenon with respect to mortality. For the July to August period, the adjusted magnitude of this effect is 0.122 percentage points. And the magnitude of the July phenomenon represents a 4.3% increase relative to the average mortality rate of 2.82% for major teaching hospitals. So perhaps as many as one in a thousand hospital patients in July die merely because they were hospitalized in July. To put this figure in perspective, this is roughly your disc risk of death in the next year. So you guys have about a one in a thousand risk of dying in the next year, and that's the risk faced by patients who are admitted in July, rather the excess risk, rather than in uh, June. And finally, there are ways that the medical care can be harmful beyond one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, so are there any questions so far on, um, on these types of uh, very specific uh, you know, things we've been discussing, these kind of... Um, any questions? Yeah. I guess I'm wondering what the check analysis system is in the surgery room. Like, I, I don't know if you're the doctor. Yes. There are elaborate checks and balances. So it's not like doctors don't know about this problem. Okay, so they do. And there are many, many checks and balances and repeated steps and procedures to avoid these types of disasters. There, were, there was a spate of cases where people were operated on without anesthesia. So when you're anesthetized, uh, you are given drugs that uh, uh, make you fall asleep. Uh, and then you're also given drugs that make you go flaccid. So they, they, they paralyze your body. And, uh, and there have been a number of cases, one every two or three years, where there was been a goof. This was up until a few years ago. I'll tell you what they did to stop this. Where uh, the patient uh, was, there was a mistaken administration of the first anesthetic agent. Uh, and then that, because there's a sequence of drugs that's given to anesthetize the patient. So they give you something to induce anesthesia. And then they give something to maintain anesthesia. And they, let's say, forget to give you the drug to maintain anesthesia. But they do give you the paralyzing drug. So you're paralyzed and the surgeons are cutting you open and operating on you in agony for hours. It's, un it's just incomprehensible. And there's no way you can cry out or tell the doctor that what's going on. So they invented some procedures to stop, to check this, uh, heart rate monitors and the like to see what's happening with the heart rate. And they also had situations in which accidentally patients were intubated in their stomachs instead of in their lungs. So you put the tube in, like when you look into the patient's and you're trying to thread the tube into their trachea and oops, you goof and you put it in the esophagus. Then you start pumping and things 
look like they're working because they're putting air in and out of their stomach, and like their rib cage is moving, and actually they're not getting any air and they die uh, as a result of this. And so what they added to check for that is they added carbon dioxide detectors to the exhaled gas. So if I'm pumping air in and out of your stomach, your body is not producing any carbon dioxide in your stomach. So I can check to see if I've correctly intubated you. So now every device and every, every intubation device in every hospital for anesthesia checks for exhaled carbon dioxide. And if the number is zero, oops, the tube is in the wrong place, which happens very rarely, et cetera, et cetera. So people are aware of these problems, obviously, and they're trying to stop them. But the question still becomes, when mistakes are made, you know, is it, is it the doctor's fault, or is it something about the system that if we redesigned would, um, would reduce it? Did I answer your question? Yeah. Other question. It's a, it's a good question, and it's, it tends to be closed. It, we wrote a paper on this, if you're interested, with a former medical student of mine a few years ago. If you Google Christakis blame or something, you'll find the paper. It was in Social Science and Medicine. We talk exactly about your question. And, and, and the doctors um, don't discuss these things, generally speaking. And there's movements afoot to reduce the sense of blame and to, re and to increase reporting so that the systems can be be resigned. And there's actually a very particular reason for this, which I'll come to in a moment, why doctors um, um, don't report it. Not just that, but why they feel responsible, why they take the blame, and why, as a result, it's partially a secret. Other questions? So finally, there's another way that medical care can be harmful beyond the one-on-one -on -one effects on the bodies of individual patients that we've been considering. Because medical harm can also impose a kind of because medical care can also impose a kind of collective harm, and this is one conceptualization of what is meant by social iatrogenesis in the Illich readings for today. A very straightforward example of social iatrogenesis is the is the creation of drug resistant pathogens that can spread in human populations. This slide plots historic data from the National Nosocomial Infection Surveillance System, and it shows the percent of a, of a, of a bacterium known as Staphylococcus aureus uh, of Staph aureus infections caused by methicillin-resistant Staph aureus is plotted over just the last decade. So this is the fraction of Staph aureus um, uh, extracts that are uh, resistant to one of our most powerful drugs against this pathogen, okay, rising across time. So the needless or heedless or inappropriate use of is creating a selection pressure on the pathogens. The pathogens are evolving to escape this uh, antibiotic uh, selection and are evolving the capacity to be resistant to these antibiotics. And often this is due to the careless prescribing of antibiotics uh, for conditions that they don't, uh, the patient doesn't need or doesn't benefit from. And there are many examples for this. Multidrug resistant tuberculosis is a serious problem. Multidrug resistant HIV, MRSA that's listed here, or vancomycin resistant enterococcus is another so-called VREC, is similar to MRSA, is another so-called, um, is a drug resistant pathogen that's serious. And the careless, these, these administration practices are careless at the societal institutional level in terms of the drug policy we have, at the doctor level, in terms of the prescribing behavior, and at the patient level, in terms of drug seeking. So if any of you ever ask for an antibiotic again for what is a viral illness, which is most likely what you get in the winter time, you are contributing to this problem, harming yourself and others in the future. The doctor should not be giving you antibiotics for chest colds unless you have a bacterial infection, which is typically not the case in young people your age. In fact, um, some drug resistance, it's clear that some drug resistance is unavoidable insofar as organisms evolve in, even under the thoughtful and desirable use of antibiotics. But even here, greater care might reduce the harm. In fact, nationally, the Centers for Disease Control uh, estimates that as many as 2 million nosocomial infections arise every year from all pathogens and are acquired in hospitals each year, resulting in 90,000 deaths. So almost 100,000 people die every year from becoming infected with nosocomial infections when they are admitted to the hospital. So nosocomial infections alone would be, again, in the top 10 causes of death. And Illich, of course, making a much more subtle argument and means something a bit different and broader by his conception of social iatrogenesis. And his critique of medicine is strident and compelling. He thinks of social iatrogenesis as a kind of over-medicalization. 
as a kind of expropriation of health. It occurs when people are encouraged to use doctors for more and more trivial problems, and it captures the tendency of medicine to damage health, not via individual bodies, but via affecting the total social milieu. So here's how Illich defines social iatrogenesis. This is different than clinical iatrogenesis. Okay, so clinical iatrogenesis is the kinds of stuff we were considering in the first part of the lecture, when something I do to you harms your body. Now we're interested in a different uh, effect of doctors on the total social milieu. And here's how Illich defines it. Social iatrogenesis designates a category of etiology that encompasses, that encompasses many forms. It obtains when medical bureaucracy creates ill health by increasing stress, by multiplying disab disabling dependence, by generating new painful needs, by lowering the levels of tolerance for discomfort or pain. So when the healthcare system tells you that any kind of minor symptom you have is something that can be treated, Illich thinks that's bad that it's making you dependent on the healthcare system, is alienating you from your own personal experience in your own body. So he continues, social iatrogenesis designates a category of etiology that encompasses many forms. It obtains when, also, by reducing the leeway that people are wont to concede to an individual when he suffers, and by abolishing even the right to self-care. Social iatrogenesis is at work when healthcare is turned into a standardized item, a staple when all suffering is hospitalized and homes become inhospitable to birth, sickness, and death, when the language in which people could experience their bodies is turned into bureaucratic gobbledygook, or when suffering, mourning, and healing outside the patient role are labeled a form of deviance. This is what Illich means by social iatrogenesis, the way in which our healthcare system uh, corrupts our experience of our lives and, and ramifies through our society. He also goes on to describe cultural iatrogenesis, which destroys the human ability to deal with human weaknesses. People become distanced even from their own lives, from their own humanity. Here, medical interventions interfere with the authentic experience of our bodies, of suffering, of birth, and of death. And Illich is concerned with the adverse impacts of the social construction of disease. He is concerned with the ways in which the definition of a condition as a disease can cause harm. So Illich and Martin are in a conversation. He asks, what does it mean when the doctor detects a disease that the patient does not? What is the ontological status of that type of condition? You don't feel ill, but I tell you that you're ill because I'm a doctor and I have expert knowledge. What does it mean when the patient detects a disease that the doctor does not? And what are the consequences for individuals and for society of labeling patients with diagnoses? These are the kinds of questions that Illich is considering. And writing in 1976, he anticipated and was very critical of the system's perspective on medical error. And so this is his critique decades before the system's perspective, which is ascendant now. Uh, this is the critique he offered. With the transformation of the doctor from an artisan exercising a skill on personally known individuals into a technician applying scientific rules to classes of patients, malpractice acquired an anonymous, almost respectable status. What had formerly been considered an abuse of confidence and a moral fault can now be rationalized into the occasional breakdown of equipment and operators. In a complex technological hospital, negligence becomes random human error or system breakdown. Callousness becomes scientific detachment, and incompetence becomes a lack of specialized equipment. The depersonalization of diagnosis and therapy has changed malpractice from an ethical into a technical problem. So as usual in this course, I give you readings that are in tension with each other. Reason and Illich do not agree at all on the nature of the sources of medical error, on blameworthiness, or in the proper response to what we should do about the system. Like you, they have differences of opinion about whether the doctor, the father and the, was or was not responsible for the baby, or the doctor was or not, was not responsible for removing of the wrong kidney. And they come to different answers and different prescriptions for how we might handle this state of affairs. And in fact, it seems as if there's plenty of blame and responsibility to go around at all levels. And returning the, to the question I was asked earlier, one of the reasons I think that doctors actually are willing to take the blame when medical care goes awry 
is because they personally want the credit when it goes well. On some level, they realize that if I'm going to feel so great about myself that I have saved this patient's life, I did it, not the system, then the flip side of that is that I have to take responsibility and blame when, in fact, I don't save the patient's life and I otherwise injure them. Um, are there any questions? Scratching head or a question? Scratching head. Yeah. Um, one of the images you showed us of like safe, regulated, dangerous. How come they cut it off like in a flat line instead of like a? Yeah, that's a very good question. That's just an arbitrary. They just put it there. Reason put it in his book. I, the argument Reason is trying to make is that that paradoxically, even though healthcare has the frequency of adverse events and the rate of fatality per encounter that puts it in the same league as mountaineering, we, uh, we aren't regulating it as much as things like nuclear power and European railroads and so forth. Which, so he's just trying to make a rhetorical argument. It, the technical details are not exactly relevant. He's basically saying, why do we regulate nuclear power more than, than healthcare? You know, we should, we should do more addressing these systems. Other questions? Yeah. Yes. So there's, yeah, there's no doubt that uh, that that sh that the length of the work week for physicians and the shift, the ch the, the sleep deprivation and the shift work have uh, adverse consequences. And there's actually a very uh, large literature in sleep medicine where they treat doctors as an object, as a problematic object. Like these doctors are exhausted, and. Um, it's very difficult. When I was a house officer, my first year in internship, this was before the new laws were passed, our average work week was 96 hours. I was in the hospital 96 hours a week. And I very rarely slept. I mean, it just was not the expectation that you would sleep. And you would get in bed, at, you know, finally at 3 in the morning, and you'd have to get up three hours later to round at 6 to pre-round before your resident came in. So you're only sleeping for three hours, and the phone rings at 4 in the morning, and it's the nurse that, that's calling about a disaster in some patient. It is so tempting to say, you know, forget about it. Uh, or to just listen with half an ear and say, well, I'll do this and I'll, I'll come in a few hours. So you, it takes an incredible, um, uh, not just strength of will, but incredible set of systems in place, frankly, to, to get you to do stuff. And one of the things I always used to do is I used to always force myself to get out of bed and stand up when talking to a nurse in the middle of the night. But it's not easy. Yeah. This is a big and complicated question. I entirely agree that it's crazy, these hours, and they should not exist. And uh, people have been advocating for this for a very long time. There, it's a complex mix of cheap labor that's available in these hospitals, uh, guild protections on the part of doctors not wanting to train as many physicians, the belief that actually being in the hospital for many hours is a good teaching experience. And, and there's some truth to that, too, I have to say. So, you know, if you, if you watch, the, if you admit the patient with a heart attack, and are in the hospital for the next 36 hours, you watch what happens. If you check out in eight hours and then come back 24 hours later, you miss it. You don't actually learn as much medicine. So it's, and in addition, when you have lots of short shifts, you introduce errors by handovers. So I admit the patient, four hours later, I pass him off to you, I tell you, this is Mr. Jones, he came in like this, this is what he looked like on admission, but you didn't see him on admission, you don't know what he looked like. You take care of him for eight hours and then pass him off to Amelia, and you say, Nicholas told me yesterday when he was admitted, he was green in the face and sweating and was complaining of pain now, he's been okay when I had him, but now he just developed a cough, good luck with that. And you pass him off to Amelia, and then I come back 36 hours later and I say, what the hell happened to my patient? Look what you guys did to him. You know, it's like frequent uh, handoffs can cause problems as well. So it's a complicated topic, but in general, I think we can do better on the hours. Any other questions? Yeah, last question. Um, since they just, like, since the study of the July effect, like, has there been any systematic Yes. There, there are many changes. They put the best attendings, the best attending physicians, and the most experienced residents in the most dangerous spots in July. So when, when, the, when, when they're making the ROTA schedule in July, they look at the 24 residents in the hospital and they put the ones that th were the best interns in the intensive care unit. So they're the newest, they're the new residents that are in charge of the ICU. I mean, it, when, when I was in training, when I was a junior resident at the U University of Pennsylvania, except for the attending in the emergency room, when I was in the ICU on my ICU rotation, at the age of 27, 
I was the most senior doctor in the hospital. I mean, it's, it's shocking, actually. So, um, so they, they try, and I was not given uh, July the honor of being fly, but, uh, but, they, uh, but they, try to put, they try to do this, and they try to put attendings with excellent judgment and vast experience at the beginning to check at every level what's happening. Yeah. Yes, it does help. Yeah, but it, you know, it doesn't eliminate the problem. Okay, good luck on Thursday, and I'll see you guys next Tuesday.